Hello, everyone, for attending uh, the Stanford IT Forum on this beautiful uh, November 10th of 2023. Uh, today's speaker is the brilliant uh, Heiji Kim, who is an uh, assistant professor at University of Texas at Austin. Um, Heiji, we have the, the pleasure, the, the honor of having her be a Stanford alumnus. So uh, wonderful to have you back and uh, looking forward to the talk. So uh, without further ado, uh, take it away, Heiji. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. And thank you for inviting me here. And um, thanks for coming to my talk. It's great pleasure to give this talk and um, see some familiar faces and names. OK, so my talk today is going to be on neural distributed source coding. Um, this is joint work with several of my colleagues and students whom I'll acknowledge along the way. So let's just get to the motivation. Like why, why are we talking about this thing, right? So the motivation here is that there are increasingly many scenarios where we have distributed information across multiple devices. Examples are think about sensor networks. Let's say you have some LiDAR sensor or some sort of um, audio sensor or some camera or multi-agent robots that are wandering around but you may have multiple camera views that are distributed. And those scenarios, what we have is usually, we have the server or the data center who collects all the data. And in collecting all this data, what's really important is to compress each data efficiently. So efficient compression of distributed sources is crucial. And if you think about the current um, system, what happens is the following each robot or the sensor or um, information node, whatever, will compress its own source separately. Say this encoder will encode its own signal x1, and this other encoder will encode x2 and x3 separately, and the server or the receiver or the decoder will recover each source separately as well. So everything is sort of separate, and we know that under this setting, um, for example, to achieve a lossless compression, we need a rate where each rate is greater than or equal to the entropy of its source. This approach, however, is um, clearly suboptimal, and that's because we are not leveraging any correlation in the data sets. The distributed source coding setup, which I'm showing here, it considers the setting where we have multiple encoders and one decoder. So I'm showing the example with um, two encoders. So encoder one has access to X1, encoder two has access to X2, where X1 and two are correlated, and they will do their own compression. The decoder will take both M1 and M2 and then aims to recover both sources. And for simplicity for now, let's talk about lossless compression. The celebrated results by Slepianov, which is now a textbook material, shows that um, we can achieve lossless compression as long as the rate, especially the sum rate, is greater than or equal to the entropy of um, joint entropy of x1, comma x2, which is effectively the same rate you need when you have a single encoder that compresses x1 and x2 all together. So this is as good as one can expect. Well, um, we are going to consider a special case of the distributed source coding. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that one of the encoders, the say encoder two, has sufficient um, bandwidth or it can compress its message losslessly. So say X2 is available readily to the decoder. And I'm going to change notation a little bit because um, a bit simpler for the future parts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say the encoder has a source X Right, and then the decoder has access to um lossless version of Y, where X and Y are correlated. So X is a source, Y is now side information that's freely available at the decoder. Okay, so we consider this setting. Um, so one encoder, one decoder, but now the decoder has side information, which is not available to the encoder, by the way. Okay, so this is a special case of the distributed source coding in short DSC. Okay, so with that in mind, I am showing two figures. One is the distributed setup, um, which I explained just now. And then I'm also showing another setup where the side information Y is available to the encoder and decoder. 
So now for this setting, we can easily find out that the encoder will need a rate of entropy of X given Y because the encoder has Y as well. And if X and Y are highly correlated, the recoil rate will be lower. And slap and Wolf shows that um, the distributed encoder is just as good as a joint one. Even for the distributed setting where side info Y is not available to the encoder, um, as long as the rate is larger than entropy of X given Y, we can still get the losses compression. Okay. So that's a pretty nice result. And how is it possible? So I want to introduce an um, example that illustrates the slap and Wolf theorem. And this example is initially proposed by um, Sandeep Pradhan and Kanan Ranchandran in 1999. So here's a setting. Let's say we have a source X that is um, length three binary bit sequence, length three bit sequence, and Y is also a length three bit sequence. And the correlation is given by that X and Y differ by at most one bit. Okay, so now let's think about the joint encoder set setting. What the encoder can do here is encoder will take Y, X and Y together and they will compute the difference between the two. And the difference can be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 0. There are four possibilities. And the encoder will simply compress or send the difference which requires two bits. The decoder can then um, take the difference and then Y and then reconstruct X losslessly. That's the idea there. Now what's interesting is the distributed encoder um, still needs to share only two bits. And how is it possible, right? The idea is to use a binning. So what the encoder does here is the encoder will sort of group 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 together. So the idea here is you take two possible sources that are far away from each other, like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then put them together into one bin. Let's call it, say, bin 1. And similarly, you bin the other two that are far away into the second bin, and the third bin, and the fourth bin. So you do the binning, right? So now if the decoder only has the bin index, the decoder cannot recover x, right? However, um, now that the decoder has access to Y, um, now the decoder can choose one within the bin that's closest to Y. For example, if the bin index is one and received Y is 0, 0, 001, then it will go to the bin, the first bin, and see which one is closer to Y. And you realize X has to be 0, 0, 0 because X and Y are different and most by one bit. So that's the idea. So it's, the encoder will sort of like bin things that are far away from each other. And then the decoder will use side information to figure out which one in the bin is the right um, source. That's the idea. And this idea can be generalized to lossy compression as well. Um, although things are a little bit more subtle now that we have to deal with some sort of quantization and distortion and stuff. Um, here the setup we still consider the distributed encoder setup and the joint encoder setup, but now we are going to consider um, the setting with distortion. So we define a distortion metric and then we'll measure the distortion. We want to characterize the trade-off between the rate and the distortion. And the um, Weiner Z theorem um, established the fundamental limit here. So it's shown that the uh, rate that's required to achieve distortion D under the distributed setup is given as what's shown on the right, while the joint setup requires this much rate. So we do realize that the two expressions are different because the optimization is over PU given X versus PU given XY. So they are certainly different. However, they do coincide for some special sources such as Gaussian ones, but of course they do not coincide in all possible cases. Okay, so they do coincide in some cases, sometimes they don't. But what's clear is generally speaking, the side information should be quite, should be useful. It should be better than not having any side information. Okay. All right, so at this point, we talked about some classical information theoretic results that are from around like 1970s or so. And now let's think about how we can apply this to the practical system. Can we come up with a constructive algorithm achieving these nice results of Slepenhof and Weinel-Ziv? 
Um, well, the proof, the achievability proof relies on binning, like random binning and doing typically decoding, which is computationally expensive. However, in 1999, um, Sandeep and Kanan came up with a beautiful algorithm for distributed source coding using syndromes. The idea here is they do the encoding based on coset based binning using some channel codes, and then the decoder will do um, syndrome based decoding. And there are several extensions made afterwards as well. Um, this was extended to like low seek compression, vinyl zip setup, more general source distributions, and more than two sources, and also has been applied to um, compression of videos leveraging the interframe correlations. So that's a very nice result, right? So now my question is, okay, that's great. So can we now apply discuss or discuss like algorithms to emerging um, DSC applications? Well, we face a few challenges, right? So the first challenge is that the sources are complicated, right? The distribution of sources is often hard to model analytically. Say, so think about the images, some sensory data, high dimensional, it's hard to model. Sometimes we may not even have access to the distribution per se. We may only have samples or data from those distributions. And another aspect is we may not have um, many IID sources. We may wanna do a one-shot compression, right? So those are some challenges we are facing. So the cannot, existing algorithms cannot be directly applied. Well, then we look around, we realize that data-driven approach has been successful in addressing these challenges. And it has been also successful in compressing a single source. And there are several ways, um, several methods in within the family of um, learning-driven compression, but I wanna focus specifically on the variational order encoders, which is naturally um, connected to data compression. So I'll do a quick review of variational order encoders. Okay, so um, we have an encoder and decoder. At the end of the day, we wanna learn an order encoder with some capability of generating new data. And so we have an encoder um, and then latent vector is usually modeled as a Gaussian, um, Gaussian vector where the mean and the variance will depend on the input. And then we have a decoder as well. The training is done to optimize the loss that's partitioned into two parts. The first part is called the reconstruction loss. Here we're looking at how close X head is to X. So we wanna um, recover the original data. That's a natural term there. And then we also have a similarity loss. Also it's equal to the KL divergence between the learned um, the, the latent vector and the latent that we believe should be the latent, like the Gaussian one. And this second term here, the KL divergence term can be also interpreted as rate required to compress the latent vector. Okay, so variational order encoder is there. It's some sort of order encoder. How is it connected to the compression, right? So, well, we look into the loss function um, and what we realize is the following. The loss function for the VAE is also called the evidence lower bound elbow. And if you think about how we got this loss function, there's a story. For variational order encoders, we want to find the encoder and decoder, which maximizes the log likelihood of the data we are seeing. That's a natural thing to do when you learn an order encoder. So ideally we want to optimize um, log P of X, log likelihood, but this term is intractable. And therefore we derive a lower bound to the log likelihood called elbow. And that can be factorized into two terms, the distortion term and the rate term. That's a connection between the VAE and the compression. So that's a natural connection. So it's natural to apply VAE for data compression. Okay, so now um, I'm ready to talk about our approach in neural distributed source coding. And let me first um, acknowledge my collaborators here. Um, Jay Wang and Elliot and Anish are UT um, students. And then um, Alex Imakis is my colleague at UT. Okay, so um, here is an outline for our approach. 
I'm going to first talk about how we frame the, um, the variation order encoder for learning the distributed source coding DSC, where we extend the VAE. So I'm going to talk about the framework first, and then I'll get to the objective. Um, we establish a connection between the log likelihood objective and the rate distortion for this um, distributed source coding setup. That's our second agenda. And finally, I will talk about um, how we handle the quantization. Because at the end of the day, we want to get the discrete latent representations. OK. All right, so um, framework. So our framework is uh, fairly straightforward, actually. We are generalizing the VAE to um, conditional VAE. So what we are doing is we realize that the decoder has access to Y, decide information Y. Um, while the encoder does not have access to Y. So we just give Y as an input to the decoder. That's uh, how we frame the decoder. And then we to keep, keep the encoder as is per se. Okay, so this is a conditional VAE. Um, and then um, what we really need is we need an objective. What should we, I mean, what should we optimize? We have an encoder and decoder all fine. What are we optimizing? So in this regard, we establish a connection between the distributed source coding problem and we introduce a modified modified um, evidence lower bound term. Okay. So a natural thing to optimize in the conditional VAE framework is we think that is log the log likelihood of X given Y. The setup is we have data sets X comma Y pairs and we want to learn an autoencoder that will maximize, that fits the data well. Maybe what do we mean by fitting the data well? We think that it will be a um, good fit if you have, if you choose the um, autoencoder, which maximizes the log likelihood of P of X given Y. But that's not a tractable term. It's an intractable term. And then we derive a lower bound to the log likelihood. Um, and then we realize that the lower bound, which we call distributed elbow term, has two parts in it. One is a rate, like in the um, scalar uh, single source compression case. And then we have one more term that is a distortion term. The distortion we get when the decoder uses both side info y and the compressed compress message z. So we establish a connection between the, um, the log likelihood, conditional log likelihood, and a new bound, um, the lower bound, the elbow bound, which has a natural connection to the um, distortion plus rate. And afterwards, we use the elbow as our training objective. Okay, so with that, um, finally, I want to introduce how we handle the quantization. So we adapt, adapt the idea from the um, vector quantized VAE. Um, so here, essentially, what happens is very similar to VAE. We have an encoder and decoder. And in between the two, we have a quantization layer. We have a quantization layer where we have explicit um, codebook space with fixed number of code, code words. And then in training the VAE, we are training the encoder and decoder and the codebook while we want to optimize the um, distortion as well as the quantization loss. So we do the training with quantization in place. We are adopting the Fuki VI idea. There are advantages in doing this. Um, we do have an explicit control over the maximum codebook size that's um, hard coded. Um, however, we realize that empirically, the learned codebook is not uniformly used which means the codebook can be compressed further. So we do this. What we do is we learn a latent, um, the, the distribution of the codebook, and we do the further compression using, for example, auto-regressive models. OK, so now we are ready to delve into the experimental results. Um, I'm going to show you um, three set of experimental results. The first one is, um, well, we really wanted to verify that the we are leveraging side information well. And how do we do that? It's not so clear, but one way to do this is compare the distributed um, learning results 
along with the joint coding result where side info is available at the encoder and decoder, which serves as an like upper bound in a way. And then we also wanted to see how our method compare against the setup where we do not have any side information labeled um, separate. So we chose a pretty complicated data, um, data set or task. So here what we have is um, the input X is on upper half of a saliva faces and the Y side info is a bottom half of saliva faces. If you ask me why would this be ever practical, you could imagine having multiple cameras capturing different parts of the human face. Okay, so what we notice immediately is X and Y are correlated. They are, you know, kept featuring the same person. However, the correlation structure is pretty arbitrary. I mean, it's not like Y is a noisy version of X. It's pretty complicated correlation that's hard to model. So that's our setup. And then we train the um, conditional Fourier VAEs um, and we compare distributed joint and separate. We, and we see that the joint one um, and distributed one are pretty close. The distributed one is, and it's better than the separate one. It achieves better performance. So the higher the PSNR, the better this is. Okay, so that's a good sign to check. Um, we gain over um low side info setup. And then we moved on to the second experiment um, where we deal with the stereo images. Okay, so here is the setup. Um, the input X is a stereo camera view one. And then Y, the side info, is another camera view. And these are stereo cameras, which means the two cameras are pretty close to each other. And they are, in a way, like one view is a shifted version of the other view. So there is a lot of overlap. It's a highly correlated data set. Okay. And um, this is a very practical setup. And there are several research on compressing the stereo images specifically. One of them is the um, called DSIN. Um, it's developed by um, Isaac and Avitan in 2020. So all I'm saying, want to say here is the following. Um, this compression method is exactly tailored to stereo images. So what it does is the following. Let's say I have some noisy, um, let's say I have, have some noisy, uh, I want to reconstruct X part here, let's say. And then what I'm going to do is I will take the side information, side information, and then I'll see which part of my source is aligned to the clean part of the side information. And I'll try to use that and fill in the space for my X source. So it's like a patch matching, like you will see which one I should look at. And then that, that that's the key idea there. Okay, um, that's the baseline per se. And then I want to introduce um, another work that was actually done in a similar time frame as ours by Mittal, um, Ozilkan, Garjani, and Gandas in 2021. So um, they their work is pretty similar. The difference is they use the variational autoencoders as opposed to vector quantized variational autoencoders. And more recently, um, they developed further improved their idea by introducing some attention layer in the decoder. And also more recently, um, some other um, researchers, um, Zhang, Xiao, and, and Zhang, um, developed the learning-based distributed multi-view image coding. So this multi-view image, stereo image compression is of, of high interest. Okay, so let me show you the results. Um, so this is a result we got um, in 2021. So um, ours, it's shown in two lines. One is the one with the latent um, uh, distribution learning. So as I said, the Fuki VAE latent representations are not uniform. Therefore, we can do further latent um, compression. This line is with that. And then dashed line is without um, such further processing. And we see that those are um, comparable and sometimes better compared to NDIC, the other concurrent work, and, and DCIN, which is specifically designed for stereo images. Um, and, uh, and about two years later, like quite recently, um, the NDIC, the, the work by um, the, the concurrent work, 
had extension using the attention model, cross attention module. And what we realized is that ours um, is comparable to that concurrent work as well. I'm not mentioning here, but our architecture number of parameters is smaller than the other baselines by around four to six fold. Alrighty, so that's experiment two. And then our final experiment is dealing with um, gradients. Gradients. So the motivation for this experiment is we wanted to um, apply our algorithm to applications other than computer vision. So we look for data sets that are correlated, high dimensional, and gradients just came up. Gradients are high dimensional, and there are many correlated gradients that need to be compressed for federated learning or distributed learning. So our setup is, um, is as follows. We have an input that's gradients from one client, and the side info y is another gradient from another cli client. And both of them are doing a uh, training the MNIST classification module model. Okay. And so, so we train the um, compressor based on some data collected on this gradient, which means we had to do a mock run and then collect the gradients. And in terms of results, we looked at the mean square error in compressing the gradients. But perhaps what's even more interesting is what happens to the actual um, training that occurs with the compressed gradients. So here we are plotting the tested accuracy as a function of um, epoch for the joint compression versus distributed and separate compression. The distributed one is not as good as joint one, but it does better than the separate um, compression, which does not use side info. So side info is being used. On the right hand side, we are comparing ours against the other classical gradient compression methods, which typically rely on the sparsity of the gradients that does not use side info. And we see that like generally we converge faster than the other baselines. Okay, so those are empirical results, and it's interesting to think about like what are we learning. What's the interpretation? So, 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 yeah, let's think about the results. The first part is what's the role of side information? Is side information doing anything? That's the first question, right? So, here is a ground truth. So, this is upper half and the bottom half. The upper part is the source part, and the bottom part is the side info. So, if you use a correct side information, um, the reconstruction for the source will be roughly like this. It's a bit blurry, or it's a bit blurry. There's some noise or distortion, right? So, but it's still, it's, yeah, it seems to be a good, you know, reconstruction, although it's blurry. Um, now, if we give a wrong side information, say woman's face as side info, then let's see what happens. We are still getting mm, the, the man's uh, face on top but we see different colors. And this part here looks a bit like a hair to me. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, but we see that things are affected, meaning side information is being used, maybe not dressed dramatically a whole lot, right? Because colors are changing, but the entire overall shape is there. What happens if we use say some randomly thrown side information? Um, then our reconstructed image will be um, sort of um, not at all informative. There is no information there. I mean, maybe there's something, but yeah, it's very um, hard to interpret. We guess that's probably because we didn't quite see random side info during the training. So overall, side information seems to be used. And we did one more experiment to see if side info is being used. We trained two um, models. One is like ours as is. And the other one is we train the um, NDSC, neural DSC, using side information that's not relevant to the source. And we see, we measured how diverse the sam decoded samples are. What we see is um, if we use side information that is uncorrelated, um, the diversity of the decoded sample is pretty low because there's not no side information is not doing anything. But in our case, since side information affects the outcome, the code sample, we get some diversity, um, which sort of quantifies 
how much diversity we're getting from or from side info, which um will be an indicator for whether or how much we are relying on the side info. So that's one um agenda. And then next, um, what we have done is we asked an interesting question of can we learn discuss um the the syndrome based coding idea from synthetic sources. That was a pretty aggressive goal here. We asked a question and then here is what we got. So in short, um, we got some negative results. Okay, so the setup here is as follows. We generated 648 IID binary correlated sources. So we have, um, we are, and we are encoding the 648 IID correlated sources together. And then we implemented this course using LDPC codes, the standard LDPC codes. And then we compare this against the neural DSC that's ours. And then we are plotting the block error rate, the error rate as a function of um, how correlated the two sources are. So, well, it's more of the other way around, meaning like probability of a P flip. So P flip being zero means the two are exactly the same. X and Y are the same. And then here means X and Y can be a bit more different. We see that LDPC, the discussed algorithm, performs noticeably better than the neural ones. Um, and I would admit that um, in this setting where distributions are very clear and well-defined, neural DSC it cannot learn this cost algorithm. And honestly, it's not too surprising because learning a channel coding at this length of 648 is very hard. It's very hard. So if you want, if the goal is to learn some syn algorithm for synthetic data sets, we have to rethink how we design the, the DSC um, framework. On the other hand, this also implies that a lot of gain in neural DSC is coming from being able to model the complex data distributions. That's another interpretation from this experiment. Okay, and the remark I'd like to make is recently, um, Oz Ozilkan, Ballet, and Arki um, showed that neural distributed compressor um, discovers binning for one-shot compression of Gaussian sources and, and several more. So here they looked at the setting where um, a single source is so one shot compression, one source. So there is no idea, there's no you know channel coding gain of such, um, but they show that binning can be discovered, which I think is very interesting. Alrighty, so um, to summarize the first part of my talk, um, we introduced a conditional VQVAE framework to learn DSC where we introduced a distributed elbow objective that connects DSC and the um, VAE framework. We have verified um, empirical results. We see that our algorithm, our approach um, utilizes decoder only side information. It's often close to what's achievable with encoder decoder side info, the joint coding, and it's easily outperforms one that does not utilize the code side info, i.e. the separate coding scheme. With that, um, I want to also talk about some open problems. The first one is the um, hybrid approach. So we see that this course is pretty nice for um, well-defined, say, IID sort of sources. However, in re reality, a lot of data measurements are not IID sources, right? But I do guess that probably we can apply neural feature learning to sort of align align the um, the two represented X and Y, let's say, learn embeddings of X and Y that are like this IID like um, IID like correlation there, in which case we can then apply this cost. So I think combining the um, synthetic um, algorithm like this cost algorithm and neural networks together will be um, a really exciting direction. Another question is, yes, we see some gains, but fundamentally, it's a natural question, like, how far are we from theoretical limits? And along these lines, I see a very exciting research opportunity here, where we can we'll apply the um, recent threads of work 
on rate distortion estimation and mutual information estimation. I recall the last week's talk was on, on some of this too. That's number two. And number three is application. So we get the algorithm right away. We get the constructive algorithm that we can apply in practice right away. Um, so then really like, can we take this and apply it to a real world setup? That's the next, that's the next question, All right? So um, this work, we have done this um, in 2021, um, in, um, a long time back. So for the past years, we've been thinking about this. Um, what can we do? What would be interesting to do? And one thing interesting happened is um, we had an opportunity to talk with some people from Honda Research Institute, and they are building like crowd navigation robots. So some sort of like distributed communication needs to be needs to happen and so on so forth. So we we told told them what we have done, and then they were saying, okay, that sounds very exciting, um, but we need one more piece, and that piece is distributed compression is great, but the objective should not be um, recovering the sources alone. We wanna complete some tasks. Right, and ideally it would be great if we can do that with various uh, rates as well, depending on the uh, bandwidth available. So that's how we extend this work further. It's more recent. Um, we've done this like this year, this joint work with um, three students, Pohan, Sraban, and Rui Han, and researchers from Honda, Hossein, Essan, and my colleagues, Ufuk and Sandeep. So, so this is our first work along, along bringing TSC to real world. Okay, what's the setup here? Well, really what we want is we want a decoder that performs a task. Like think of object detection, for instance. Let's say we have um, house cameras here and there, here and there. The central, the, the server here doesn't care what's in, what's in the camera. All it cares is it wants to know whether there is a thief or some abnormally or something, some object detection. Okay, so we have a clear task out there. And to simplify this setup, here's what we have. We have several um, sources that are distributed. Distributed encoders are there. And then there's one decoder which takes the um, compressed messages. And then it will pass through sort of its, you know, pass, it wants to, at the end of the day, perform a task. So it wants to um, estimate, let's call it Y, Y, a function of X1 up to XK. This could be object detection or, or anything like denoising and so on and so forth. And so this is our setup, task aware DSC. So the goal here is um, the goal here is to design encoders and a decoder which A preserve information that's relevant to the task, right? Because maybe not all information needs to be preserved. That's number number A. So we want to preserve information that's relative to the task and B. Ideally, we want to exploit the correlation across multiple sources. That's our second goal. And C, um, it will be great if we can support various compression rates. Okay, so these are um, three goals that we have. And before we get to the, um, delve into the thing, we look around and then we see what's out there in information theory. And we do realize that information theoretically, it is well justified that task aware DSC can be much better than task unaware DSC. Not always, but in some cases, um, such as modular two sum for binary sources and so on and so forth, this is totally possible. Um, but also it's interesting to note that the general, general optimal rates distortion trade-off is not known up to date. So it's a long standing open problem. This is something I'm interested in and working, I'm working on this as well, but let's not get to that for today. Anyway, so we have some theoretical justification, task aware DSC should be better. So let's do it. Well, we want to construct algorithms for task aware DSC, right? And again, we face challenges. A, um, tasks are complicated, right? Task may be um, neural network models. It's not like a modular to sum, it's some complicated function. And the sources are also hard to model analytically. We may not have YID sources. So we have these um, challenges. And again, our goal is we wanna design a task aware and correlation leveraging TSC. And our approach, um, we take two steps. First of all, 
um, we will do the following. We will assume that we have a linear task, okay? And then we also assume that we have a, have a linear encoder and decoder. So we're restricting everything to the linear space. And there we focus on um, dimensionality reduction first. So these things are analyzable in this space. That's what we do first. And then afterwards, um, of course, in reality, tasks are nonlinear. Therefore, what we do is we combine the linear encoder um, and decoder all the way together with neural networks. So this is like an, our hybrid approach. We want to sort of combine theoretical um, answers along with the capability of learning. Okay, outline. So um, I'm going to talk about these three things. First of all, I will introduce our framework. Okay, our framework. Um, we combine um, the theory-inspired theory module, i.e. the linear dimensionality reduction module, along with neural nonlinear representation learning module. And they will train um, this entire framework so that we can support dynamic rates. This is our framework. So I will introduce the overall framework first, and then I'll get to um, the in linear dimensionality reduction modules. So I'll, I'll provide some theoretical um, justifications on the uh, on this part, after which I will talk about how we train the end-to-end -end framework to support dynamic rates. This is overall outline here. Okay, so let's talk about the framework. Um, framework. There's a lot of mm, a lot of boxes here, but it's not too complicated. Bear with me. So, okay. So there are um three parts I want to talk about. First is the linear dimensionality reduction module, which is labeled as DPCA, linear projection. So we have um DPCA. This is a linear model that we I'll talk about later. So we have some linear data pro um projection um in place. That's what we analytically derive. That's the uh, DPCA, the yellow one here. That's the yellow one here. And secondly, we have the neural network, um, neural encoders, the gray encoders, and the gray decoder. Now, those are neural networks, and they are trainable, and we learn them. Okay, they, they, these are what we learn. And then finally, um, I want to talk about the rate here. So we envision that the um, the when the sensors or robots are around, they may have different bandwidth um, over time, or for whatever reason, they may have different um, um, budget in bandwidth. So what we want to do is we want to have a way of choosing the bandwidth um, in 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 selecting the final dimension of the um, of the of the data compressed message. So those are the three pieces. Okay, so it's an overall idea. And let me get to the um, linear dimensionality reduction part first. So, so, the, so here we are simplifying things a lot. Okay, so we are assuming that we have a linear task and the linear encoders and linear decoder, one decoder. Let's say we have two sources, x1, x2, that are in n-dimensional space. Um, we are assuming that the task y, task output y, is a linear function of x. By that, I mean that the y is equal to a um, matrix pi, uh, phi, pi times x1, x2. So, so everything is linear. Task is linear. Encoder is also linear. The compressed message, say zi, is equal to ei times xi. So there's no nonlinear function. There's only the ei, the matrix, that will project the n-dimensional data into di-dimensional space. And the decoder is also linear. Take the compressed messages G1, Z1 and Z2, and then multiply another matrix M, right? Another matrix M. Okay, so then what do we want to do? We want to um, design, say, the encoders and the decoder E1, E2, and M, assuming that we have some sort of data sets, um, X1, X2, data set collected over some um, time points. And then we also want to optimize the rate, rate like D1 and D2. Okay. So that's what we want to do. Linear, in, linear encoders, linear decoder, linear task. Let's optimize encoder, decoder, and the rate design. So we do run the analysis on this one. And we were able to solve the optimization problem 
where we minimize, aim to minimize the reconstruction um, task, task loss. And here we made an assumption, which is not actually quite practical. We were assuming that one of the source, say X2, has access to another source, say X1, so that it can remove the part that is correlated um, with X1 from X2, meaning we can reconstruct, say we construct X2 tilde is equal to X2 minus the parts that can be predicted from X1. And then with that assumption, what's nice is we can decouple the optimization problem into two parts where which can be solvable by um, principal component analysis. So this is all solved. And what's nice about this approach is we can get to estimate the importance of each representations based on the singular values, because we are gonna do a PCA um, for the first source and the second source. So we can know which um, sources are more, more important per se. And that can be used to allocate bandwidth based on their importance. The, um, the downside, however, is that these are optimal when sources are uncorrelated and the lower the correlation is, the less, um, I mean, if there are more correlation, it's gonna be a bit more suboptimal, which needs to be resolved. Um, but analytically, it's hard to resolve this challenge. So we rely on neural um, neural networks. So that's how we, or why we introduced to combine the DPCA, the linear projection together with non-linear representation learning along the way. So for example, if the representation learning, the E1, E2, and so on and so forth, and decoder, if the neural networks happens to learn representations that are linearly uncorrelated, for example, then DPSCA will be optimal. If you ask me, is that a desir desirable thing? Um, I'm not sure. We're hoping that the neural network will figure out what's the best to do um, for the given data set. Okay, so now let me talk about the training. So this is a framework I'll, I'll find. How do we train the encoders and the decoder? In training this module, um, we will rely on two things. One is the task loss, which is evaluated after we perform the task. And then in between the um, task uh, function and the encoder, we will insert a layer where we re reconstruct these sources as well. And the reason why we do this is, first of all, this can serve as a regularizer. Maybe we want um, compression that focus on task, but still can recover the data to some extent. So we want to have some flexibility there. And the other thing is um, occasionally the task function is given and cannot be trained. Um, say object detection module is right there, it's intact. So in that case, um, we cannot touch this and therefore we should take the existing task uh, function as is, which means we'll have some intermediate input to the task we might as well see how well we are doing in terms of reconstruction there. Okay, so that's the overall training framework. Finally, um, to support various, various rates um, so that we can later select the rates based on the bandwidth available, in the training stage, we, show, we train under various um, rate constructions. So we are training the encoders and decoder only once under various lower dimensional um, data redu um, dimensional reduction there with various yellow boxes there. Um, and that way, what we achieve is we achieve one neural encoders and decoder, one, one training, one set, and that can be used for various rates because the li linear projection layer is the one that's governing the final rate selection. Okay, so um, that's about it. And I'm ready to explain the experimental results. Um, we run three experiments. One, um, one is the noising task, where we have two sources. One source is noisier than the other. Robotic arm control, different camera views. And airbus detection, different camera views, but some overlapping area. So in this case, we see that source one has more, more, has more information than source two. And in the interest of time, I'll talk about our final experiment, the Airbus detection. So here the setup again is there are two sources. Um, source one has, has, is, has wider view than source two. And then what we want to see is that, for example, we want to see that source one 
uses more rates um, or allocates more bandwidth than source two. And then eventually we want to compare whether task aware TSC works better than task unaware one. So here is the results. Um, I'm showing the results for task aware versus task unaware. NDPCA, the green one is our task aware and task unaware is the one that is um, brown that's on the bottom. So task aware is a lot better. It's a lot more efficient. And another interesting thing we observe is that ours is actually sometimes better than the joint compression, the, 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 the purple one, the purple one here. And we think that's probably because we are, the, the linear modules are serving as a regularizer, but it was a surprise to us. Another point I wanna make is, as I said, view one has more information than view two and that's reflected in the rate selection. So here I'm showing the dimension of latent space versus the distribution of the bandwidth. And the blue one is the bandwidth used by um, the first source, which is a lot higher than the bandwidth allocated to the second source. So there are some adjustments made based on the um, value of information. Okay, so what, we, what have we learned? Um, some interpretation. We see that um, here I'm showing the ground truth images, um, and then I'm showing the reco reconstructed um, images from task aware approach where we ignore the reconstruction. And then on the other extreme, we have um, task unaware approach where we try to reconstruct the image. So the task unaware one or task agnostic one tends to recover the image very blurry, but sort of thing, some things are there, I guess, right? That's what it's learning. Task aware, task aware, on the other hand, really focuses on performing the task. So it tends to learn some non-human interpretable representations, but it's sufficient to perform the task. With that, I wanna conclude. So um, we talked about distributed source coding and task aware DSC. Um, leveraging the correlation and adaptive bandwidth and especially the bandwidth assignment is based on the importance of its source to in performing the task. And the key takeaway I want to bring up here is um, natural information theory insights are very helpful. A lot of work on compression and also um, communication as well are focusing on single source, single communicate, single, single communication or compression setups. I think distributed um, correlations can be leveraged. It'd be fascinating to have them um, used in practice. Um, but we um, we see that there are some limitations with the classical results. We may not get much constructive algorithms and that's where data-driven approach can help. And finally, um, yeah, applications, um, we are still pushing um, on the application side. And one of the challenges I wanna bring up is robustness, right? Because in practice, the data sharing medium is, is noisy. And then it gets to, do we wanna do a joint search channel coding? I know like Saki's group had a work on the joint search channel coding next and extending this to um, multi-source scenario will be very interesting. Uh, also, um, had dealing with heterogeneous distributions is very interesting. I don't see a lot of work on data compression for diverse distributions, and that's something we are working on as well. Finally, um, I want to note that um, an interesting avenue of future research is how can data-driven approach help advancing natural information theory? Right, so probably one way to go about this is begin with the synthetic setup and do some sort of hybrid approach, augmentation, that's one way. Another way which I am actually looking into is um, can we establish um, some sort of optimality or at least evaluation of rate distortion reasons using learning? So that's another avenue that I find um, very interesting. Okay, that's about it. I spend about 50 plus minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll stop sharing. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hishi. Um, 
Are there any questions from the audience here? Yeah, thank you for clapping uh, on, on <laughs> Zoom. Uh, I, I love the reactions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, fire away, Saki. Uh, thank you so much uh, for a really impressive talk. And I did clap uh, non-virtually. I actually clapped. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> I wanted to ask if you can comment about the um, the complexity, the compute, both for the training and then for the actual deployment of these things and how mm -hmm. they come to like, you know, existing uh, approaches. That's a great point. So I would say, um, let me see. Um, so the thing is, um, you mean by existing approaches? Do you mean the classical, like, like you know? Yeah, like, I, yeah so like, um, like you, you talked about discuss and. Oh yeah, uh huh. Well, yeah. Let's say for for that uh, setting. Yeah. So for discuss, if you compare it to discuss or like JPEG or any classical commercial compression algorithms, neural ones are way more complex for sure. So there is an issue of compressing um compressing the neural architecture itself. That's that's certainly true. Um that being said, our compression networks are not incredibly huge either. So compare, for example, um compared to those the classic, you know, usual um say classification model models, object detection models, our compression network is like on par or less complex than those other ones yeah but certainly there should be a further step in in um dealing with the complexity that's very very true and that's also why i think it would be nice to connect discuss and neural network somehow because discuss and those algorithms are very powerful already um it's just that we need to align the data in in some in some correlation that's all we need Okay. Uh, so, if go ahead. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just about to comment that uh, we also are encouraging our students who are taking uh, the course on compression to view uh, the lecture, and uh, many of them will view it, but offline. So you're going to reach uh, more than yeah, I, people you see. I, I was just going to mention that, Saki. Actually, when you're giving your talk, I was thinking like we just covered uh, rate distortion in in class, and mm -hmm. so uh, I think we'll make an announcement on Monday when we have our next class about you know this is uh, rate distortion and you can apply ML and things like that. I think we're really cool. So yeah, thank you so much for giving a talk. Um, like I said, for the audience, it should be up on. Uh, Monday-ish after I finish editing and things like that. So thank you all for attending um, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. <laughs>